know how many seconds? Three breaths. Unbelievable. <sighs> And then the third one, the, my field of view started breaking up into hexagonals, black. And I couldn't take the fourth breath anymore because I was going down this black hole. <laughs> but I knew I had to give myself over. That's the, the other thought. I knew I had to just let go. And I did. Uh, was there then bliss thereafter? It was terror and bliss. Mm. It was this weird combination. It was just bright, you know, there was this uh, bright light with sort of this singularity and just there was three things bright light no self no Christoph no memories no thought no future no past no time no space no fear there was just terror and ecstasy you know with this modern renaissance there were so many people and then I got curious I wanted to experience five MEO DMT you know which is this very you know this near death experiences and because I said, well, A, I'm just curious, but B, also, if I claim to be a student of consciousness, and here we have a technique that can rapidly and dramatically and sometimes transformatively change your experience of the world, well, then I for sure want to experience it. Yeah. Because, you know, the, 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 um, the, dicto the uh, motto of the Royal Society is uh, no use in verba, in verba. Take no one's word for it. And for consciousness, you, you know, you, you, I want to see the data. I, that, you know, show me the data. Now, for consciousness, it's not just I want to hear your account, but, you know, that, that's the difference between look, studying black holes or viruses or brains and studying consciousness. Ultimately, I can only directly experience this. Yeah. So I wanted to directly experience this. There's no Turing test for consciousness. So the problem of consciousness is not just what most people think, oh, you have to explain how anything can be conscious. That is a problem. But then you also have to explain in each case why is the, why is the particular conscious experience the way it is. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Whether I'm on mushroom or angry, these are different experiences. Yeah, and you yeah. have to explain how I can have different experiences. Yeah. Consciousness may be much more widespread than we think. Yeah. That even very simple system very, very simple system. So, for example, a bacteria, a single cell bacteria, may already feel like something. Now, what does it mean? A single cell bacteria has already, let's say, 10 million proteins of a thousand different types. No one has ever simulated, I mean, that's people who attempt to simulate single bacteria, but no one has ever done it completely because it just, we can't do it right now. It's already of vast complexity. It's very yeah. specific. And a larger consciousness, as you said earlier, would wipe out sort of, uh, if we, the two of us, connect, sort of, and it becomes this new maximum integrated information, it will wipe out our conscious experience. Correct. Suddenly the complexity, this fine measure of our integrated brain will exceed that of my brain by itself and of your brain by itself. Mm. At that point, what will happen? Hans gone, Christoph gone. Instead, there will be this new Ubermind, okay, this new amalgamation of Hans and Christoph <coughs> that'll see out of four eyes, <coughs> that'll have two mouths, four limbs, etc. Then I am the world, because then I experience the world and me as being identical. Did you have that experience? Uh, yes, I did. And I, I somehow tapped into, I felt, I mean, I experienced tapping into having this, I'm, I'm the universe. I know it sounds trite and it sounds, but, but. No, to words, me it does not. To me words. it definitely does not. I've, I've been there in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of that way, but, but it's, um, it's just the, the, the shock, but that's, that's to me the shock, what to make of it, right? Because that experience is so real. And when you get out of it, you know it was sort of your mind on drugs. And then again, for me at least, sort of the, the, the old narrative kicks in again. You also say the dictum, you know, no brain, never mind, right? A brain, never mind. So the, 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 no, no brain, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then that narrative starts again, and, and, and then when it fades, but it's so real, right? And what I, what, what sort of a question for, for you is, I mean, because you understand the brain, you understand consciousness, you have, have, have spent your whole career theorizing about this. How do you theorize about this experience? What can you make of it? 
Also, I was totally perplexed, completely perplexed for several days. I had a long, I called up uh, uh, my very good friend, Giulio Tononi, who's mm. the, the, the person who started Integrated Information, the architect, the chief architect of Integrated Information Theory, just to try to make some sense of it. <clears throat> he tried to bring me down by saying, well, do you believe it was your brain that caused it? I said, well, yeah, it's something... I did take, you know, I participated in the ceremony. If you've done it, you know, they yeah. take like 10 hours, 12 yeah. hours, and you, you chant, you dance, and you, you partake of, of Santa Daime. Um, I know all of that. So in my, in my normal moments, I say, yeah, it was my brain on, when you have the, this very powerful, psychologically very powerful ceremony, you know, that puts you in this very powerful expectancy effect and this group effect, and then you take... You, you take the, the ayahuasca brew and on a, in a combination of that, my brain. So what it, the conservative interpretation is, what it shows that brains are capable of having extraordinary experiences. Yeah. Okay, and now I've had this myself. I, it's not only that I read about other people having it, but I know now firsthand that brains are capable of this experience. Now, other, but maybe, and this is where the ontological shock comes in, maybe this is really the black swan Right, all it takes is one black swan to wonder, well, maybe there's something fundamentally wrong with this point of view. Um, uh, and so I was trying to make sense of it. I read, um, I, I, I had Schopenhauer with me, I read Schopenhauer again, and he makes this beautiful comment about, you know, when the, um, in, the in this, um, what I think he called the aesthetic moment, when the, the person merges, the apprehender merges with the apprehender, when mm. the knowing, Noah no, merges with the knowing you become a pure, um, will-less uh, s um, subject. And that's exactly what I had. And then I was looking around and then I came upon the, the, um, uh, the writings of Bernardo Castro, the, the analytic yeah. philosopher, and was really, you know, uh, read his book and was really tantalized by that. Uh, so now I'm, you know, I'm in this, I'm in this in-between state from a metaphysical point of view. Mm where because I study the brain, you know, the nice thing with the brain, you can take it and you can put electrodes in it, whether it's a human or, or a animal brain, you can record it, you can poke it, you can stimulate it. And, and there are lawful relationships between this brain and conscious experience. Like if you stimulate my back here, in most yeah. cases, you'll get visual experiences. And if you if I lose bits of this visual brain because of stroke or gunshot, or whatever, I will have loss of visual experience. So by some measure, there's these very lawful relationships between brains. So doesn't this imply that ultimately it's all a product of ultimately of the brain substrate? Well, yeah, it seems to be true, but then I had this experience. So how do I explain that? Is it really true that there is a universal mind? So why don't I experience right now? There are all sorts of confusions about IIT, partly because IIT is a, um, a non-trivial theory. I can't just explain it, you know, like saying, well, it's quantum mechanics or something like that. So it's a very non-trivial theory. Uh, it, has, um, it has certain axioms, certain assumptions, which one has to understand, and it has interesting, powerful implications. Uh, so it's not easy to understand, so that means that lots of people misunderstand it in all sorts of expected and, and always surprising, very unexpected ways where, where IT says fundamentally the opposite from what people say. So the, the example you mentioned, IIT in some sense can be argued to say that con consciousness is not computable. There is no software running on a digital computer, as currently conceived, a phenomenal machine, no matter how complex, no matter, assume it simulates the human brain, assume it simulates your brain. So it's software, let's say Python code, running on in the cloud or supercomputer, wherever, and it mimics you. So of course it'll mimic everything you say because it actually models the brain. It models all the neurons and then models, you know, Broca's area and, you know, and it talks. And of course it'll say, of course I'll see. But IIT would say, no, it does. It's not a computation. It does not arise from mere computation being performed on a, um, on a Turing uh, machine. So this is, the, however, this is the dominant paradigm of our day and age. It's called computational functionalism or machine functionalism. It's a metaphysicalist assumption 
that that anything that has a function can be instantiated on a on a machine like a Turing machine like you know mm. our computers are good models of Turing machines the one you carry presumably in your pocket is a good example of a Turing machine and so you can ask our machines conscious today and you know chat GPT we, we all know right it's it's quite intelligent and most people were, or the people who were concerned themselves would say well maybe not now but it's just a question of let's wait another you know chat you know chat uh, GPT 4.0 or 5.0 that they're working on right soon it'll be conscious and it's true soon these machines will have all the verbal utterances of a very intelligent human being in fact Soon, machines will be able to do anything you can do, anything any human can do, but they will never be what we are. They will never be conscious. And that's one of the clear uh, conclusions that IIT comes, comes to, that at least digital machine as currently conceived will never be conscious. Everyone wants to do psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In fact, if you just you know sit in your airport uh, in your airplane seat and you mentioned you know I'm a neuroscientist working on psychedelics, oh that's interesting. Now we're what talking. Do you do now we're talking. Now we're yes, talking. Yeah. yeah. And gotta remember, unlike in Holland, in our country it's illegal. Yeah, you really have to go to the jungle. Yeah. My first mushroom experience, I I knew what it's all about. I got to yeah. the heart of the beating heart of the universe. I finally understood it. Yeah. It remained ineffable. But I carried and, but, it still this, with me. But there was, yeah, that was your mushroom. But this DMT one went deeper. Five meo DMT. Yeah, five meo DMT. Yeah. Yeah, that's a terrifying experience. I'm never ever going to do a game. Um, yeah, it was a. It felt like a near death experience. Yeah. So you lose. also, I guess, because it's so instant, right? It's like in how many seconds? Three breaths. Unbelievable. Was there still a self? to be terrified at that moment or was you at that moment my last thought was holy shit what have i done <laughs> but it was timeless there's no time yeah, passage of yeah, time comes yeah. to so, so it's sometimes extraordinary and the other extraordinary thing two hours later you're perfectly fine i mean i walked out of the house perfectly fine that's so crazy the non-toxicity of it right your brain just knows what to do with this molecule it <laughs> and uh it's remarkable. Well, so, A, what it, what it really brought home, once again, the centrality of consciousness, because at that moment there was nothing, there was no self, and there was no world, there was only consciousness. So, it's really, consciousness is absolute, it's the only thing that truly really exists for itself. Yeah. Not even self-conscious, because there was no more self, there was no crystal. There was, yeah. Yeah. So, that really, number one, first and foremost, that the world... I don't know whether the world exists. In that case, there was no more world. Well, if a point of unbearable lightness, you can, I guess, still say it is part of a world, but it's pretty minimal. <laughs> and so, of course, I was terrified. You know, I woke up, I totally cried because, you know, I just lost everything. Unbelievable, yeah. So, it's, it's, it was good in the sense of it... Um, I discovered this a few weeks later because up to then I had more often as I got older uh, I had these episodes where I lay uh, awake in bed at night and I had um, uh, death fear you know you just think about yeah. death being dead forever and ever and ever it's terrifying right? Yeah. and I discovered a few weeks later huh, I haven't had one of these since then and this was now four years ago and never had it again that's yeah you write about a calmness a calmness that sort of has yeah. uh, and so as it's, it, it's a nice benefit. Yeah. And the trick is, I'm um, talking to many people, reading about it, you have to let go. You really mm. have to let go. And the first time it happened was when I had this trick, I just I let go. And when you resist or you afraid, you say, no, I don't want to do this now because of this, that, and the other. Yeah, so you, you, you have to become, I mean, think about it. Gravity, we all experience gravity every day, all the time we born into gravity we will die in this gravitational well that's planet earth right and a very rare condition when you take one of these planes you can you know be be weightless for a minute or when you become an astronaut you know you become uh, weightless but those are very rare so it's same with self we always are 
within the confines of the gravitational field of the self, right? You always, there's always somewhat observing and how that, what does it mean for me and what does it mean for my long-term well-being, etc., etc. And and removing the self is very, very difficult. This is always observant. Mm. And so that's a trick. You have to let go. Just yeah. let it be and just be part of the experience. As, as Schopenhauer said, mm. no more distinction between the apprehender and the apprehended, between the knower and the knowing.